Thank you, Lisa and Nicole as well, and all of you who are attending today and also listening to the recorded uh, session. Um, there is a growing recognition and understanding among inter intermediate grades, four and five, and, and even in middle school, uh, the growing awareness that our kids are not completely there with their word analysis skills yet and automa automatic decoding. And what do we do? How do we advance and take our children who are gaining from the explicit systematic instruction in the code in the lower grades and continue that instruction in the intermediate grades and, and middle school? Um, it certainly does look different and it sounds different because the kids are at a different place in their reading abilities. However, we all know that we continue to have struggling readers whose reading levels do continue to, uh, to uh, be growing um, at the lower levels, which in, impacts their ability to uh, access the text that we want them to read in those grade levels. So teaching morphological awareness has become a passion for me because number one, it's really fun. <laughs> Number two, fun for teachers and students. And number two, so many teachers tell me that they're hesitant to teach morphological awareness or they don't understand what it is, or I'm not so sure I can go there because of my own understanding of morphemes and how to teach them. So my work is really devoted around giving teachers a sense of I can do this. And those of you who do understand morphology and feel more comfortable giving you some alternative ways to think about morphemes when we look at the reading brain and what it takes to develop automatic word recognition that it simultaneously accesses meaning. So morphological awareness is mesmerizing. It's easy to get into this world of words and where, what are those meaningful parts in words and what is the etymology of the word, the history of this word, and to become hypnotized by this world. And I'll get into that a little bit more. <clears throat> so let's get started because our time is gonna go really quickly. I hope that you had an opportunity to locate the handouts and have those and we'll be able to follow along with those as we as I go through the, the presentation. If you don't have them, you'll be able to access them later and uh, use them to review the content. So our focus today, this is a quote from Stanislaw Dehan's book <clears throat> on uh, his uh, work with brain research. He says, Explicit instruction cannot stop after first or second grade. Students in third grade and beyond must continue to master the essential components of reading, learning tools and strategies to decode complex, multisyllabic words, and applying knowledge of syllables, morphemes, and word origins to read, spell, and comprehend words. That's where we're gonna be focusing today, and we will call this advanced word study skills. So in our time together today, let's define what advanced word study is. Why does advanced word study begin with syllables and then at the same time engage us in a study of words through the words morph morphology? And why should we do this? How does it contribute to word, word reading or reading in general ability? We're gonna examine our own morphological awareness as we go through this information and learn how to teach both syllable and morphological awareness, and at the same time, creating interest and curiosity about words. Okay. So let's start by looking at the brain <clears throat> to ground us in why we do what we do and what is happening in our, our students' brains. We're looking at the left side of the brain here, and a researcher uh, not long ago in a session I attended, um, reflected on our discussion of the reading brain. And she said, I prefer to call it the language brain. And that stuck with me because truly, we are working with a language brain when we teach reading. Language is what develops within an environment where language is spoken <clears throat> and heard. 
young children learn, begin to learn that language, we're biologically wired for language. And those centers on the left side of the brain are what help us acquire to perceive, store, and retrieve that language, both expressive, ex receptive and expressive language. <clears throat> So when we are listening to language, that phonological processor right in the front here, the Broca area, is perceiving that language, perceiving the sounds of the language, which are then decoded. Those sounds are decoded so that meaning can be accessed. So the meanings of words, words are stored in the temporal lobe right here. And to access that meaning for language, the phonological processor perceives that language and decodes it to make those units and that language meaningful. Enter, the child enters the classroom and we begin to you take that language brain where all those words are stored. And there is another element that comes to play and that is the visual. So the visual then kicks reading into action, kicks that language brain into action. But what must happen first is that language form, or excuse me, the word form area in the back of the brain right here, which stores faces. It helps us with our word, our face recognition for one thing <clears throat> is now going to store letters as linguistic units. And those letters, map through the phonological processor as those graphemes are converted to the language that I can make sense of and, and uh, locate the words in my meaning processor. I go through the phonological processor, it's decoded, those sounds are decoded and meaning is accessed. So using the language, taking the language brain into account, the brain, a miracle happens when we introduce letters, the written form of the word, which must be trans, transposed into the language I can understand, that language that I hear and that I speak. Okay, so this helps us understand that for reading to happen, I need to see the word and be able to identify it, to decode it. And we know what enhances that word recognition for reading is encoding, to hear or to think the word and then to encode it or to spell it. I refer to this as the yoga move, kind of like in yoga, we do a back and forth. If you do this movement, your next movement's going to be the opposite direction. So in our word analysis and what we'll be tying all of this to today in our discussion of, of morphology and teaching that advanced word analysis is we want children to perceive visually the word, to have already heard the word, to have built the photological structure and the meaning of the word so that when I see the word to read it, I could simultaneously decode it and access meaning. And then to reinforce that pathway, we're going to build in writing of those words. So spelling those words, writing them in a morpheme lexicon, for example, using those words orally in sentences to talk about something that we are learning, connecting it to a, a, a familiar context, connecting those words, speaking those words and writing them. So seeing it to read it, hearing it or thinking it to write it, okay? that back and forth activation pattern, building that into our lessons can create that orthographic mapping, which is seeing a word, recognizing it instantly and accessing meaning simultaneously. So let's test this on our own reading brains. I'm gonna show you a word. How well is it mapped into your language brain through reading? Did you read it instantly? I'm sure you did. It's a very familiar word to you. What context is in your, temp your temporal lobe here that you connected juvenile to? Very common one is juvenile delinquent. How about uh, the juvenile fish were ready to release into the stream? Young, young uh, fish, right? Okay. So you read it instantly. It's mapped. You've got context. That's just um, it's there in your brain 
<clears throat> for reading and for um, and and its meaning, of course. Here's another word. A little bit slower recognition there, or maybe not a recognition, but were you able to read it? There's a reason you were able to read this word, even though you weren't, um, uh, maybe or are not maybe familiar with this word. Um, you probably thought crepuscule, because hmm. maybe it's similar to molecule. You're thinking of another word that it rhymes with or may have similar syllables. Do you think it's a noun or a verb or an adjective? You have a lot of sense of this word because you have morphological awareness. You probably are thinking it's probably a noun and you're right. So its meaning is, um, let me see if you, the, the meaning is twilight. So the golden crepuscule was a beautiful sight to see. How do you read this word? You're primed for it. What part of speech is this word? The crepuscular sky was an amazing, beautiful sight. It's an adjective because you know many other words, muscular maybe, uh, ending in AR that are adjectives. So you even know how to use that word in a sentence. That's a deeper level of knowledge that we call awareness. You are aware of the morphemes in words. You can manipulate those morphemes. You can bring meaning to them, develop an understanding of the syntax of the word, okay? So now you are mapped for crepuscular. The, this, word, <laughs> this word was a new word for me. I had to look it up. I was reading a, a book translated from Spanish and Isabel Allende um, novel. And the, um, the old aunties were all talking one night about the young um, niece who was leading a, a scandalous life. And in the evening, those, uh, the crepuscular tongues were busy speaking about the niece. Crepuscular tongues. So it was twilight. It was evening. Um, but what a... What a, a what a way to, to, to uh, bring that into, into a story as a descriptive word um, for these aunties. Good book, by the way, uh, Portrait and Sepia. All right, <clears throat> so taking a look at that language brain and then how reading maps onto that language brain, it happens developmentally over time. If you're teaching the intermediate grades, middle school, even uh, upper third grade, your students are probably in the consolidated level. These are Aries phases of word recognition development. In the consolidated level, your students are decoding unfamiliar words by syllable, by morpheme, by analogy. So if they see a word they've not seen before, like you did crepuscular, you probably were without even realizing it subconsciously, pulling on knowledge you have about other words, their phonological features and their spelling features to read an unknown word. That is a consolidated reader. But I also know that several of your students in those grades are probably not yet fully consolidated. Starting out at the pre-alphabetic phase, there are three elements of reading that uh, help us determine the phase our students are in, but also provide the uh, uh, tools for us for teaching. So in the pre-alphabetic phase, the student does not yet know letters or connect them to phonemes. They don't have a phoneme awareness of those words that they speak and that they hear. And they would write a little love note that looks like a heart, okay. But they begin to move into the partial alphabetic and these are overlapping. They're not stages where you finish one stage, you move to the next. You can have a foot in both partial and pre-alphabetic when you begin to learn letters and name them and make some association to uh, of the phoneme awareness, letter knowledge. I don't think I told you the three, I'm sorry. Phoneme awareness, letter knowledge, and phoneme grapheme relationships. And in partial alphabetic, ah, I'm getting some phoneme awareness. 
I have some letter knowledge and I'm making a few associations to letters and I might write, I love you in this way. Moving into the full alphabetic phase is where children are learning all of the graphemes that are associated with the uh, vowel sounds, specifically and consonant sounds or phonemes in our language. So letter knowledge is moved to grapheme knowledge, which means more than one letter might represent a phoneme. Complete phoneme segmentation has happened and all of those uh, phonic skills are being learned. But at the same time, these children are starting to encounter multisyllabic words and beginning to develop an appreciation for morphology. When I add that S or I see an ES at the end of a word, it could be a plural. Past tense is always spelled ED, whether it's a T sound or just a D sound, right? And I know that I have to change it, double it and drop it when I add those syllables or those um, uh, suffixes to the ends of words, depending on the spelling organization of the word. Right? So these are the kinds of, of uh, grapheme and, and alphabetic principle or uh, reading elements that children are learning in the full alphabetic and probably still firming up in the consolidated. So if your children are in, for the most part, in the consolidated phase or even that upper full alphabetic, they are ready to begin this deeper advanced word study in syllables and morphemes. Well, a full alphabetic will be developing a wide range of sight words. That means not just high frequency words, but words that they could see in print and read immediately. And then in the consolidated phase, uh, that uh, acquisition of language has developed uh, and uh, is um, up to 4,000 plus new words are seen in print every year. And so vocabulary grows as a result of my reading as well. So let's start with syllables. So why syllables? Mm, if any of you have listened to children read, especially those who are in that full alphabetic and they come up to a multisyllabic word, all of a sudden their decoding stills just seem to fly out the window. So it's important to have some syllable instruction and it's quite a leap from the single syllable to the multi. We start with compound words and compound words because lend themselves very nicely to morphology as well because each of these words in a compound word has meaning. So backpack, one word, two, two meaningful units. House fly, one word, two meaningful units. A fly that lives in your house, backpack, a pack that we wear on our back. And then move to uh, two syllable words that have closed syllables, those CVC patterns, which are the first words our children learn to read, put them together into multisyllable words. Basket and robin are two examples. And then we turn to begin to introduce to those common words children can read, those inflectional suffixes and those spelling changes that happen. We have two syllables here, bay, bees, and we have two morphemes, baby and plural, es. We introduce uh, the uh, uh, inflectional ending uh, past tense, which has three different sounds. Ed, which would add another syllable, as in floated, or d, and, and rested too, or a plain d or t, but it's always spelled ed because it's a meaningful unit. Rested has two syllables, two morphemes. Jumped has one syllable, two morphemes. Jump plus ed, past tense. Okay. So the syllables might not match the number of morphemes. That's a nice awareness to begin when we're teaching that morphological awareness with our children. And then we introduce those prefixes connected to those bases, usually the Anglo-Saxon bases that the children recognize and have read. And then we move to the Latin roots with prefixes and suffixes and word forms, inject, injection. So this is a, a, a kind of a, a very, very basic and loose uh, um, 
series of, of words to take you through kind of a skill sequence as children are introduced to um, morphemes and syllables. Syllable types have been around a long time, and I'd like to do a quick review of these. I, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether it's important to teach these to students. Um, some studies show that it's very helpful. Some studies show that the children who need to apply them don't. I am still a, a pretty strong advocate of teachers understanding syllable types because the syllable types provide us um, answers to questions students ask, but why doesn't the vowel say this You know, kind of question? You can say, oh, because it's an open vowel or because it's in an unaccented syllable. The syllable types give us as teachers information to help us be stronger teachers about the written code. The most common syllable type is closed. Those are the types of syllables children le learn to read first. So they have the CVC words like pet and cat. But then when we move into the uh, multisyllable words and morphological uh, elements, we would have a word like transfix, which is two closed syllables. Trans means across and fix means to fasten. So if you are transfixed, you are fastened across, right? Okay, not a little opaque in its meaning, but that's uh, those are two examples of closed syllables. The vowel consonant E, that's one of the next vowel sounds children learn when they're reading is the long vowel, the I says its name. When we get to multisyllabic words and teaching morphemes, we might have a word like translate. There's your uh, E control, uh, vowel consonant E on late, trans means across, and late means to carry. To carry across is to translate. Open syllables are pretty uh, self-evident in those words like me, go, and ripen, but in a word like, and, and a word like truant. Truant, which is directly borrowed from the French, means actually a rogue, one who wanders from an appointed place is truant, makes sense in how we use it these days. The appointed place usually being school. <laughs> Vowel teams are typ typically your Anglo-Saxon words, those um, multi-letters that spell a vowel sound and diphthongs, O-I and O-Y. We have teeth and paint for a couple examples. And then we can add, uh, when we get into uh, prefixes and suffixes that are added to bases, you might have a word like uncoil or unchain. Vowel R, that er sound and R and or, we would have a word like transport. Trans means across and port means to carry. Consonant LE, apple and sparkle. You might see it on the end of a handle, miss meaning uh, wrong, uh, handle meaning uh, actually a tool, something you hold. Hand uh, is Anglo-Saxon and words that ended in L-E in the old Anglo-Saxon tended to be tools. Um, spindle would be an example or a ladle or a thimble. Those are um, ending in L-E, and that typically in the Anglo-Saxon indicated tools, which is interesting. And we know what those words mean, impossible, and im means not, and possible means able to happen. So let's look at a few words, starting with a simpler words and moving through a few more difficult words. We have sunflower. What are the syllables? Closed, vowel team. Um, and uh, vowel R syllable, sun, flower, three syllables, how many morphemes? Two, yeah, sun and flower. Procrastinate, what are the syllables? Pro, crass, t, nate. Procrastinate, we've got an open, Pro, closed, crass, nice short vowel sound. And then that T-I in there, this is the one. <laughs> this is an open syllable, but it happens in an unaccented syllable, which means it takes on the schwa or the uh sound. Procrastinate, 
How do we know it's not to you? How do we know how to spell that I? That's part of that orthographic mapping, reading it, taking a part into its syllables, focusing on the part we have to remember because that's a tricky part, and then writing it. So that's the seeing it to read it, talk about it, hearing it or thinking it, to spell it, to write it, procrastinate. That's an interesting one too. Pro means forward. And crastinus means tomorrow. Ah, doesn't that bring meaning to procrastinate? Don't procrastinate teaching morphology teachers. <laughs> Don't put it off to tomorrow. Okay. And that one has um, three morphemes. Quadruple. Quadruple. What are, the, what are the syllables? Closed. Open and consonant L-E, quadruple. Quadra means four, and uh, the P-L-E on the end actually means fold, so it's fourfold, quadruple. Two, uh, two morphemes in this word. So you, now you're wondering, I don't know any of those morphemes. I don't know how to talk about words in that way. And that's, if you're thinking that, you're not alone. And we just have to learn it right along with our students. One of the uh, suggestions I have for teachers is to pick a word, maybe a couple words a week to get started from your vocabulary terms and educate yourself on the morphemes in that word. Go to a, a ETYM online, that's etia, ETY, that's etymology online. Um, dot com. I'll give you that website a little bit later and enter the word and read about its history, but also it's more importantly, the meanings of the uh, morphemes in that word. And eventually your students are going to become word scientists. And as word scientists, they will begin to question and demonstrate curiosity of words as well. And um, I'll give you some tips of how to manage that in your classroom a little bit later. So if you have some of those students in your grade levels who are, who are struggling when they see the um, begin to move during that full alphabetic or into the consolidated and they're still struggling with multisyllabic words, start with those two syllable words that are comprised of uh, CVC patterns. Take them apart on separate cards, maybe even have the students do that. And then mix them up and have the students regroup uh, these to create words. So Robnet, hmm, I don't think that's a real word. Robin, Robin, yeah, that's a word, Robin. And put those two aside and then continue to group the syllables to, um, to create words. When you do this, it's best if you put the first syllables all in one column, the second syllables all in one column. So children take one from the first, one from the second, try to group them to find the words. This is a, uh, an activity that Judy Dodson, my, my dear friend and colleague, um, uses and introduces teachers to and wanted to share this with you today. So orthographic mapping is what we're after. And uh, that's the language brain becoming the reading brain. If something is truly mapped, if a visual, if a word is truly mapped, you see it, read it and access meaning simultaneously. So the first consideration, word items for study, you might have a list of spelling words. Are there any of those words that would lend themselves to uh, some morphological study as well? Vocabulary words are always the, they're there. You're teaching vocabulary, right? And there may be some words in a systematic program that uh, would lend themselves to some word study for reading and for spelling. So whether it's spelling words, vocabulary words, or the words from your program, which may be one of the two, look at those words through syllables and morphemes. If your children have come to you from, uh, in the intermediate grades, have come to you from some systematic instruction, we hope this is what that instruction sounded like and looked like. Let's say the children are learning the, the uh, vowel spelling for the vowel, uh, vowel sound A, they're learning A-I and A-Y. So if one of the words were play, the word is play, 
We're going to learn uh, to read the word play today. What's the word? Play. What are the sounds? P O A. So exploring the word with phonemes and then reading the word through the orthography of the word. How do we spell those sounds? P L and how do you spell A? A Y because this is the end of the word. Right. We spell it A I if it's internal, if it's inside the word like pain. But the meaning requires flexibility. We went to a play last night. The actors played their parts very well. How did I change the word play? Say the word played. What are the sounds? P O A D. How did we spell D in played? E D, because it changed the meaning. We're talking about last night now and how the actors were such amazing actors. So those are the morphemes. So teaching morpheme awareness right from the very beginning with those very common inflectional suffixes. Phonemes and orthography require precision. This is Charles Perfetti's work and his work with helping us understand vocabulary. Is that the mispronunciation of, of a word may impact our ability to draw meaning to that word. The orthography, the spelling of the word requires precision as well for us to share <clears throat> and be able to read someone's writing, the words need to be spelled in a way that we all recognize. But the meaning requires flexibility. This is where we bring context into our instruction and present a word in multiple syntax settings uh, and context settings. Like I did with um, the word juvenile a little earlier today. Used it in a way that maybe you weren't thinking but it, you've, it required a little flexibility. So thinking this precision with word pronunciation, this is where with dialect, we want to honor the language our children speak when they come to us from their, their homes. They have uh, their language brains have acquired the, the phonology and of, the, of words as they've been spoken in the homes in which they are loved. And we all want to honor that, but at the same time, help them understand that for when they see that word in print, it may look a little different and not match the phonemes in their spoken language. But in school, this is the way we say the word to help us read the word. So that just recognizing there's a code switching that may happen with some of your students who, um, whose dialect differs. So when we are doing a uh, practice with those basic words in the early grades, and I'm covering this in case some of you are intervention teachers or special ed, because if, they're, if you've got kids in intermediate grades who are still at the partial or the full alphabetic phase, they need this to help them advance to the consolidated. So we present the word in a meaningful context. The word is play. My father likes to play his guitar in the evenings. What are the sounds in play? P, O, A. Dot and say the sounds. That begins the map toward the orthography of the word. Let's read the word. Play. Put your eyes back on the grid. Let's spell those sounds. P, O, and how do we spell A? A, Y. My father played his guitar in a band when he was a teenager. Played. Sounds, p, o, a, and what's the last sound? D, nice. How are we gonna spell that? Because it's past tense, you're right. E, D, the word is played and the morphemes are play and E, D. Those are the meaningful parts, even though how many syllables do we have? Played, we only hear one vowel sound, it's one syllable. So then in, I, I kind of am thinking about orthographic mapping as an um, let's meditate on how we can help their kids develop this orthographic mapping in our classrooms. Given a grid, if we have the word production, they were reading maybe about the industrial revolution or something and, and the production of goods just changed. It began a whole new era in uh, material, um, material availability, production. The word is production, everyone say it, nice. Dot and say the syllables, pro, duck, shun. 
Those are the syllables, nice. Production, let's look at that word now. Production, look at the word, think about those syllables you just isolated. Come back to your grid now and spell your syllables. Pro, duck, shun. Production means to, is a form of the word produce, produces the verb, production is the noun. So the production is, is, um, is referencing the uh, um, coming forth or leading forth of goods. Pro means forward. What's the next morpheme, everybody? Duct. Pull that T in there. That's the morpheme duck, duct. That means to lead. I-O-N means a state of. There's a basic learning a lot of you are probably aware of. T-I-O-N, S-I-O-N are syllables. That S or the T is more than likely part of the root. If the word is, um, uh, if the root ends in an S, then you're, you're good. And, and you hear shun at the end, it will be spelled S-I-O-N. So we have three morphemes in the word production and we have three syllables. A way we can do that too is to use a form and this is in your handout. So I just call it syllable spelling. It may be very familiar to you and uh, 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 just a reminder. Um, let's say if you're reading uh, an article about the printing press and in the printing press, there are several really fabulous words to study the morph morphology, but even, and the meaning of course, uh, and these are words that are chosen because they are the words that we want our children to use when they talk about what they have learned. There's a key for you um, in choosing the vocabulary to teach. So if you're one of those teachers that starts making the list of words they, for vocabulary instruction and you end up with this volume of words, you know that's too many words to teach in a vocabulary lesson and you want to narrow it down. Choose the words that you would like the students to be able to use when speaking about what they have learned. At the end of the lesson or during the lesson as they're reading, what's the vocabulary that will be most helpful and useful? So one of the words in this, maybe the story about the printing press might be manuscript, okay? The word is manuscript, everybody say it. Manuscript, dot and say the syllables, man, you, script. Nice, we've got some very nice syllable types in there, don't we? That'll make it easy to spell. First syllable, man. Next syllable, you. We know we spell that with a single U. And script, manuscript. Manu means hand and script means to write. So a manuscript is something that you write by hand, a manuscript. Before the printing press, how did we get written text? By hand, right. Those were manuscripts, manuscript. And then have the student write the whole word at the end, move to your next word. You might be doing five or six or four, however many, but the children will have a very nice column of words that for study or to review once they get them, um, once you finish this activity. Another activity you could do with this um, syllable spelling is to make those squares a little bigger in there. And you could even cut them apart, put them on a table and mix them up and say, find all the syllables that we would use to spell manuscript or find all the syllables we would use to spell that word that means to write by hand. So that kind of activity is training your students to perceive the syllables as unitized. So the orthographic processor sees those syllables and reads them instantaneously in isolation and then in um, uh, when, they're, when they're put together. So that's a nice activity too, if, especially in uh, intervention groups for children who need the extended practice. In talking about syllables, I can't get through this without talking a little bit about the schwa sound because um, uh, that always is troubling to, to uh, spellers in terms of decoding, uh, excuse me, in terms of encoding and knowing how to spell that syllable that is unaccented, uh, the vowel sound in that syllable. Uh, somebody said, 
you know, we all should have t-shirts that just say, oh, schwa happens, you know, it's going to be there. And we're going to, we're going to have to deal with that as we learn and memorize the orthography of these words. So in each of these, uh, and this is in your, in your handouts here, you might look at these words and just do this along with me. But if we underline the letters that represent the schwa, where's the schwa in creative? Right, right there. And if we know that uh, for spelling, if we know that um, uh, that we hear that sound, we know that that is a morpheme IVE on the end there, and that uh, which means pertaining to or tending to creates an adjective um, that it's always going to be spelled with an I. When we have that morphological awareness, even though it sounds like of, it's going to be spelled IVE. Okay. Ago, very common. We hear that uh on the beginning, ago, around, and in those Anglo Saxon words that start with uh, we always spell it with an A. Ascent. Hmm, interesting. It starts with an uh. Well, AS is a form of AD, like advent. It changes to AS because we're adding it to a root or a base that starts with an S. So that AD is like a chameleon. And he, he, he changes his or her, transforms that D to an S so that he can blend in. So that becomes ascent and I spell AD add as my prefix. So I spell AS with an A as well. Tremendous, there's your a sound. OUS is an adjective forming element. And I always us at the end of a word. So it's always gonna be spelled OUS. So when we teach these elements to students, it, it is very uh, supportive of their encoding. It takes a lot of repetition, reminders, examples posted in the room. The same with formal, AL means like or related to. Convince, C-O-N, C-O-M, decision, okay, D-E, and passage, A-G-E, massage, Passage, those are all in, well, I don't know if massage would fit there. Mm, related to or belonging to is, is A-G-E, passage. What's another word form that you could use to compare to passage? Oh, okay, so I'm, here, I'm seeing in the chat real quick that you don't have the syllable sheet. I will make sure that that goes out to you. Thanks for, for uh, mentioning that in the chat. All righty. So odd and schwa syllables. Another way, um, besides teaching the, um, those uh, morphemes and they're connecting the sound of that morpheme, the phonology to the orthography, so matching the phoneme to the orthography, how we pronounce it, is to find another word that does have the clear pronunciation. So with remedy, we have an uh right here. Another form of this word is remediation. The E takes on a nice clear E sound to help us know that it is, is gonna maintain that same spelling even though the sound changes. Medicine, we have a nice schwa right here. Another word form that would recall that vowel sound for spelling, medicinal. I, that nice short I sound, medicinal or medic. So um, uh, th this, this is a really fun activity and, and very helpful activity too to help children explore the internal sounds in words is to give them two forms of a word that has the same root, such as remedy and remediation, and have them talk about how the spelling changes and how the sounds change. How is the spelling different in the first and the second? And how is the vowel sound the same or different? Receive, receptive, that's another really good one uh, to have them compare the roots and, and how the um, uh, origin and original uh, where does the, the stress change? Those little forms of words, uh, how they are the same and how they're different for spelling and for phonology. So here's where I'm gonna have break you into some rooms. Um, I think Lisa's uh, gonna do this for us, but let me go through an example here first, but I want you to be ready. 
I'm going to do legal for you to demonstrate what I'd like you to do. And in your group, choose either nonverbal or impassable and do the same. So explore the word from its syllables, syllable types, its phonemes, maybe the spelling, maybe the morphemes. How would you discuss it? So let's look at legal first. <clears throat> I would say, well, it has two syllables, li and go. And the first is open, li, so it's gonna be spelled like it sounds. It's also the accented syllable, which is, that's the free, I always tell kids, if you can find the accent, that's the free syllable for spelling because the vowel sound will be pure. You won't have the schwa in the accented syllable. So li, li, go. So first is open, the second is closed with a schwa, but it ends in ul, so it's probably al, legal, that helps us remember. Um, leg means law, and al means of or like or related to, so legal means it related to the law. All right, so that's the way I'd like you to explore this with your uh, partners in your rooms. Uh, wrote, write down both of these words so you know them. Uh, have them to choose from, nonverbal and impassable. And here is that website I was telling you about if you don't yet know about it, etymonline.com. Okay, so why don't you take a little bit of time in your, I'll give you a couple, three minutes, four minutes in your groups, and then come back and be ready to report here from um, group one, since uh, they were the first to leave, they were so excited. <laughs> and Judith it is in, uh, she shared with me is in Florida today, and uh, she's going to share with us what they came up with. What word did you, did you two choose or your group? We just decided on nonverbal, and we have the three syllables, non, closed, ver, our control, and bow, bow, uh, closed. And then we also agreed it was three morphemes, non meaning not, verb with the B, we think having to do with words, and then the AL adjective ending meaning related to. So we think, but not sure that it means not related to words. Is that close? <laughs> it is, absolutely. And verb actually means language. So not related to language or uh, nonverbal, non-use of language. We all know what nonverbal means. Nice, thanks for taking apart, taking that word apart. Good work uh, today. Let's have another group. How about to, uh, a group that you uh, took apart impassable? Our group did impassable. Hi, tell us where you are. I'm in Oregon, in Corvallis, Oregon. A local. Yeah. <laughs> um, we agreed that impassable has four syllables with that sneaky schwa before the consonant L-E um, and three morphemes. The root pass, meaning we looked it up, literally the Latin root pass means pace or step. And then the um, adjective ending and, or the prefix in meaning not and the adjective ending. So something, so a word that describes something that you're not able to step through. Uh -huh. or pass or right, pass. good. Through. Having a context really helps to then draw meaning to that, doesn't it? Yeah, there are um, morphological words con uh, constructed onto roots that can that fall into two categories, opaque and transparent. So like legal was very transparent, right? I mean, law, A, A, L pertaining to, pertaining to the law, something that's legal, absolutely. Impassable and nonverbal, pretty transparent. Impassable? a little more opaque, Pay, pass means to step. So to have that kind of conversation with your students too, and just say, you are becoming aware of the morphemes, that's what's important. What's more important is that you understand this word, what it means, and, uh, and can use it. And so when you read it, you'll know what it means and you can use it. So thank you for going into your groups and having the conversation. I hope that was kind of nice of you to touch base with each other a little bit. All right, we've got about 20 minutes left here. <clears throat> so morphemes, they are mesmerizing. And I love, you, you, if you've attended one of my workshops before, you've probably heard this story. But mesmerizing, um, let me tell you the etymology of this word. 
mesmerizing um, is a word that was uh, developed by a doctor named Dr. Mesmer. And Dr. Mesmer um, would say to his patients, come to me and I will mesmerize you. And he was Dr. Mesmer, made up the word mesmer, mesmerize to make mesmer. And this, so really we're talking hypnosis and, and mesmer, mesmerizing and its origin with Dr. Mesmer. So that, that's just one little feature of an of a etymology of word that can be captivating and get you interested in words. Uh, uh, think about the word chaos, what chaos means. <laughs> Its origin starts with, what sound is that? How do you spell it? In chaos, C-H. So what is the uh, origin of the word? Greek, Greek spells K with a C-H. That's another wonderful thing about morphology. It's morphophonemic. So the spellings of words will re be reflective of the origin of the word. Say So when we assess morphological awareness, there are some uh, great morpheme and morphological awareness assessments that will be coming out soon. Um, ProEd is, is putting one out by Deborah Reed and her colleagues. Um, um, test of, of uh, morphological awareness that uh, we're really looking forward to. But there are informal assessments that you can also use. Um, this uh, is just a list of uh, ways you can engage children with words and be watching how they respond to give you some information. And I know this is in your handouts and um, you can refer to this. Uh, there are also lists of words that uh, present um, words that would give you the opportunity to see how well children can uh, recognize and read inflectional endings, uh, prefixes, suffixes, compound words, and so on. Um, find these in um, reading inventories. I, pref I really like the Ekwal Shanker and I believe it's in its seventh edition now. And then um, watching and looking at our students' writing. This is a first grader. Um, and just to illustrate this, this morphological knowledge is present in their spoken language. Uh, we see uh, comparative, bigger, uh, possessive grandmas, we see a uh, compound word, so represented in their speech and their writing. And there's some learning to happen, of course, as this child moves from partial alphabetic to full in the spelling of these morphemes. This is probably more of an example of what your students in their intermediate grades would write. This is a fifth grade student. And as we look at this, it's pretty obvious this child probably has some reading difficulty. But there are some morphological errors here that uh, present themselves as wonderful opportunities for you to teach. One of them is the spelling of noticed. When the D is used to represent that t sound in noticed, that indicates that the student is very focused on the phonemes in that word as they are reading, excuse me, as they are encoding it which puts them at a lower phase of word recognition development. This student has, is feeling that flap it's called. Say the word noticed and you will notice <laughs> that your tongue gives the impression of a d sound in there. So this student does not yet have the orthographic knowledge or that pattern in the word form area that connects it to the meaning note. So note would be the where I would begin with this student and say, oh, that word noticed. That word has, is formed around the word note. Uh-huh, yeah. When you note something, you see it, you notice it. But what's really nice is they did spell the past tense ED <laughs> correct. Have to give her credit for this. And then teach notice, drop the E and add your I-C-E, which makes it a verb and noticed, past tense. So teach these words within this family. And another uh, syllable um, error here that would be nice to, lo to look at with the student is extravagant. And if we look at each syllable as the child was spelling it, we're missing a vowel in the last syllable. Every syllable has to have a vowel. 
So let's take it apart, X, Trav, and then the next is our schwa. Let's spell it with an A in this word. And then at the ending is G-A-N-T, extravagant, extravagant. Have the child read the syllables, do syllable spelling with it. This could probably be a great word for your whole class to work on. But watch for those morphological errors. They will tend to be phoneme and spelling, of course, as well. But is the, does the child have the word form, the base of the word in their orthographic memory um, with quick and accurate recognition for reading and also for decoding for spelling? Here's one more writing sample. This one is a fourth grade early fourth grade writing of a little um, report. And there are two words in here that lend themselves very nicely to syllable and uh, morpheme um, instruction. Once again, actually, that child is focused more on the phoneme in the word. They hear kind of a ch sound when they say the word. And so teaching what base, pointing out the base in actually, what is it? Right, act, actor, active, inactive, all of those words build a family. And then the pronunciation of probably. That certainly we see our children, they, they will write it the way they say it. Remember that precision that is uh, important for both pronunciation and for spelling. You can say probably, we all do, but for spelling and for um, uh, uh, and for meaning, the word is probably, probable, probably. So watch for morphological errors that you can work on quickly, easily with your students. A couple um, bring to the whole class to work on together and um, um, expect correct spelling and pronunciation. So I'll end today now with then some uh, teaching ideas for you. When you're teaching vocabulary, um, keep in mind the precision, the um, uh, flexibility, and also the four senses. So if you want to put your four fingers up like this, you can and, and do this with me and bring this into our multi-sensory instruction with syllables and with morphemes. We want children to hear the language and to speak it. We want them to read it and we want them to write it. So hear it, read it, speak it, and write it. Hear it, speak it, read it, and write it. In our lesson, here's an example. The word is produce. What's the word? They say the word. Let's read the word. What is the word? Produce, give them the meaning. When we produce something, we make it. It's a verb, we create, we generate, we bring it into existence, produce. What are the syllables? Pro-deuce. And the meaningful parts are pro, meaning forward, and deuce means to, um, uh, means to lead. Duck, deuce, okay? So let's use produce in some sentences. Okay. I will, everyone say it produce a new painting. The factory will produce lots of pollution. Will you, will you produce a project to enter in the science fair? And what do you think about this sentence? I bought my, oh, what happens to the word produce as a verb? What is it in this sentence? Right, it's a noun and we pronounce it differently. What's different about the pronunciation? Right, the first syllable becomes the accent syllable, produce. That has a very interesting history too. Um, produce was a word that was uh, first used in the 1500s to distinguish the goods that came from the farm from the goods that came from the factory. So I bought my produce at the Saturday market. Those are the goods, the noun, the goods that come from the farm and then the uh, production or the 
produce the goods that came from the, um, the factory. And then what else, what other words could we put, could we come up with or put with a group with produce that would use the same root? Induce, reduce, and deduce, for example. Might do one of those words a week, but with any of your vocabulary words, hear it, um, read it, and say it, and then write it. Um, word webs or thinking maps. If any of you know the curriculum um, thinking maps, it is phenomenal. It is such a wonderful organizational tool. It plays on the way we learn, which is organizing information, provides that organization for children. Use it with morphemes as well. Provide the stem or the root. What's a set of prefixes? And what's a set of suffixes? The meaning of the stem and have children take a prefix, connect it to the stem, add a suffix if they want. How many different words can they create from this stem? Okay, works really well with the Latin roots. Uh, I love the vocabulary grabber. Um, Lisa mentioned a little earlier my online PD course, the Reading Teacher's Top 10 Tools in the, um, which is now um, managed by Tools for Reading initial, excuse me, numeral four. So if you're interested in taking a look at tools for reading, um, search for tools, numeral four reading, and um, you can read about the course. But this is one of the activities in the vocabulary section of the course. It's a foldable. So you would have the word in the first column, a definition or an example of the word, and maybe a picture to help kids understand uh, the and recall the meaning of the word. These are words from an economics uh, unit that was being done in uh, fourth grade, I believe. Uh, this is in a sixth grade class where um, I, I was reviewing with these students the uh, terms that they would need uh, for their, um, the Watsons go to Birmingham was a novel they were reading. So we uh, scoop the syllables, we circle the morphemes, talk about what they mean, and you can take that foldable and uh, fold in inward that last column and you'll have a whole nother space for each of the words to record other word forms. Uh, for example, when we did uh, produce, you would write induce, reduce, deduce, deduction, other word forms on the back. Matching morphemes with their meanings. You know, that's just a, a pretty fun way to review. And I say to add to spelling routines here is because if you have a list of spelling words, if you're teaching spelling, many times those words, you can use, take those words and add suffixes and prefixes to them. So you can expand your spelling to a morpheme or a morphological lesson. Uh, maybe just one or two words, you could add those prefixes or suffixes to and um, build morphology understanding that way. Spin, say, write is a fun activity to do. And I, um, in the lower grades, we do it with individual words, maybe high frequency words or phonics words. Uh, with vocabulary, each of the words across the top would be written in the uh, circle, the spin, say, write circle and uh, a paper clip and a pencil point in the middle, flip the, the uh, paper clip around. And the first word the student lands on might be inject. Coming over to their grid, they would write inject in syllables. They would spin it again and get deduction, write it in syllables. They spin, they get inject again. So the next time they get it, they have to write what it means to push in. They spin and they get inject again. The next thing they do with it is to write the morphemes and so on. So every time they spin, they're working from the top for each word. This can be a week long, take your spin say right out for the vocabularies this uh, words this week and continue to work your way through. They can do it with a partner. You can change the uh, directions along the right uh, excuse me, the left side uh, column there um, to fit the words if, if needed. But this is a, a great activity that, that provides the extended practice, the read it, 
uh, the decoding and the encoding and considering these words in multiple ways. Okay, and I wanna end with morphological problem solving because this one, once a day, for reviewing words and morphemes that you have worked on in the past, the kids walk in and have a word on the board or a word uh, that is projected. And their job is to circle the stem, underline any affixes, know their meanings, and be ready to tell what the word means and use it in a sentence. So you've been working perhaps with the root rupt or maybe corruptive was one of the words in a novel that you were reading and you had studied it before. So it's on the board in the morning. There's that reactivating those, those wirings, the, the neural act, uh, activation patterns. Circle rupt means to break. I-V-E means to pertaining to or, or uh, tending to. And then core is a form of con or calm. It's a chameleon. It changes to core to match with rupt. Corruptive means to break with, a tendency to break with, corruptive. Morphine magician, last one in your class, create that curiosity. I saw the word indulge is in a prefix. Dulge, I don't even know, I don't know another word that would have that as a root. Look it up, it's directly from the Latin. It's not a prefix in a root. Matrix, we're studying in math. What is the history or what are the meanings? What is the history and meaning of matrix? Well, it was a uterus from old French, it meant womb. So it was holding something. And in Latin, it means a pregnant animal. <laughs> and then in the 1620s, it became a mold in which something is cast or shaped. So what a history. And look where we are now with matrix. Morphe Magic is my program I have written to help teachers teach morphological awareness for grades four through 12. There's a set of wall cards to support your lessons. Every lesson, children hear it and say it, they read it and they learn. Key words, a passage to, uh, to help them practice the words in context, they write the words in a lexicon, a mental lex or a written lexicon that they create. There are activities and always write connecting the words that use this morpheme to content they are learning in the classroom. A lesson can be spread out over a whole week or, or more. So review and revisit. Often those morphing magic wall cards are wonderful re for reviewing, putting them into groups to review the morphemes that you've taught. And there are many morphing websites and resources out there and these are listed in your handouts. So here's a word to end, us, uh, end our time with here. Uh, the word is, uh, what are the syllables? Well, I'm sure you saw fun and am and bu perhaps and list. Fun is well, well um, um, mapped in your mind. So your mind just grabbed right onto it. The syllables are actually few, nam, bu, list. And fune is the root meaning rope in French. Ambule means to walk and ist, one who walks rope. A funambulist is a tightrope walker. So advanced word study are those relationships between written and spoken language through the study of words and their parts, meaningful units, and how they combine to form words. So um, I know I took us a little bit over, but Nicole, were there any questions that uh, stood out that maybe one or two that we could just quickly address? And teachers, I know if you have something you need to go to and leave for. Um, we totally understand. Let's just take just a brief moment just to close together. If you are interested in ordering Morphe Magic, uh, it's morphemagic.com, or if you just want to check it out, here's my email address as well if you have uh, some questions. I think the, uh, let me just answer the schwa one really fast. When children begin encountering the schwa in their reading and in their spelling, you teach it. Teach them right away that that vowel sound in that unaccented syllable 
And to find the unaccented syllable, your voice will drop. Um, and uh, the vowel sound in a multisyllabic word, more often than not, if there's a root, will have a will have a schwa sound. And teach it as soon as they begin encountering it. Thank you, everyone, Perfect. for coming today and for your patience. I um, uh, thanks, Shan <laughs> Shanaz. I think I said your name right. Uh, there is a great video on YouTube that's a parody of a song which teaches schwa as the lazy guy. That that'd be great. I thank you for reminding me of that.